Welcome to Renewing Your Mind with the Word of God podcast, an in-depth study of the Word of God. The program's name is from Romans 12, 2, which says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Welcome back to Renewing Your Mind with the Word of God, where we take a verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter look at the Word of God, which is found only in the Bible. We are going to start a new chapter in this episode. In our last episode, we finished chapter 9, where Jesus had healed the man who was born blind, and as usual... He came under attack from the Pharisees because he performed this miracle, something that they should have been celebrating on their Sabbath, breaking one of their man-made laws. And so chapter 9 ends with that conversation, but chapter 10 picked the conversation up. So as a continuation of that conversation in chapter 10, uh, the book of John in the New Testament picked that chapter up, and that's where we're going to start in this episode. We're going to read verses 1 through 11 and talk about those here or in this episode, which as the date of this recording, April the 7th, 2023, it is Good Friday. This is the day that we commemorate when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died for our sins. He died for our sins. He took our place. He took our punishment. And this is the day that we commemorate Good Friday. And three days later, he's going to ascend with all power as a risen Christ after being buried. So we thank Jesus for that. And this episode in this in these particular verses, Jesus is going to tell everyone that he's the good shepherd, that the good shepherd would die for his flock. And he did that. He died for us. And we thank him for that. Because of his death, we have an opportunity to have our sins forgiven. If we confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he will forgive our sins. Making us new in the spirit. Joining his godly family, becoming a heir and joint heir with him. Joining God's family, eternal family, because of what he did. Dying on that cross, being humiliated, beaten and abused, and then ultimately having nails driven into his hands and his feet in agony and pain and died. And he said it's finished because he had completed the mission that God the Father has sent him to do, to die for a sinner like me and you. So this particular These particular verses ties right into that when he announced he's the good shepherd because he is the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd. All right, in our traditional sense, we're going to read the verses and then we're going to come back and break them down. So if you have not already done so, open your Bible or your Bible app to the book of John and the New Testament, chapter 10, and we're going to read verses 1 through 11. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 11, which says, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech But the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Verse number seven. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me 
are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Or some translation said, will have it more abundantly. And then first, then finally, verse number 11. I am the good shepherd. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for every day. But we, we particularly thank you for this day that your son, your only begotten son, completed your mission by dying on that cross, dying a gruesome, humiliating death for our sins. We thank you for sending him to do that. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for doing that. For taking our place, taking our punishment, that we may have eternal life with you. We're eternally grateful. We love you and we thank you. Father, we thank you for this time to better study your word, to learn about how Jesus is our good shepherd. Because he would die for the flock. He died for us. And we just thank you. We ask in your son, holy name, that you would open up our ears, our minds and our hearts to better receive and understand your word. In your son, mighty name, we pray. Amen. All right. So let's go back to verse number one. Again, we're in John chapter 10, verse one through 11. And again, this is a continuation of Jesus's conversation with the Pharisees who are challenging him for breaking their man-made law of healing someone on the Sabbath. So this is a continuation or or we're picking up where we left off or ended in chapter nine, verse number one, which says, very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. Jesus's words here continue to without pause from the end of his conversation with the Pharisees who disputed his healing of the man who was born blind in chapter nine, as I just mentioned, when used in the beginning of a sentence, very rarely, or some translations say, amen, amen implies that the speaker is presenting firsthand absolute truth. So when Jesus start his sentence out, he's conveying to them, I'm not telling you something somebody's told me. I'm telling you what I know firsthand as the son of God. Jesus is building the first of three analogies based upon the ideal of the sheep and shepherds, because, again, I've mentioned before, during this time, they were an agriculture or farm based society. So they understood those who he was talking to. And also. Think about this, the context in which this conversation is being held, other people around. So it's just not Jesus and the Pharisees. Other people are listening in to this conversation. So you have the Pharisees and other people. And so the Pharisees and the other people who are listening to this conversation, when Jesus is talking about the sheep pen and the shepherd, they understood exactly what he was talking about because they understood that culture during that time, understood agriculture because everything was based around farming and sheep and cattle. That's how they made their living. That's how they ate. And so when he's making these analogies, they got it. Now, the Pharisees didn't get it because they, he was speaking truth and he, they didn't want to hear the truth, but they that he was talking in their language, so to speak. So I have to explain and going to explain when Jesus is referring to the sheep and the shepherd, because we don't live in that society today. We're not an agriculture based society. So if you are not familiar with how that works, then you would be at a loss. But those people knew when he was talking about sheep. And shepherds, how that worked for the most part, because that was a part of their daily lives. That's what people that's how people made their living by raising sheep and cattle and other things to sell the others so they can have food and so forth and so on and growing crops. That's not our society anymore. So we have to uh, put ourselves back in that time to understand what was going on and also to understand the point that people listening. To Jesus didn't think this was a him talking in a foreign language by talking about sheep. And shepherd, because if somebody came to you today and started talking about sheep and shepherd, you'd be like, what are you talking about? You know, because people don't see sheep anymore. Nobody talks about shepherd. But during that time, they were coming. All right. So he's using this analogy. That someone who climbs the wall of a sheep enclosure or pen is a thief 
and a robber. And that day, multiple flocks of sheep would be housed in a single wall to enclose, to, in, to a pen for the sheep. All of them would be in there together. The size would be high enough to pre- prevent the sheep from getting out and wild animals from coming in to kill the sheep. This pen, this sheep pen, would have had a single single opening. This was the only intended place for the sheep to come in and out. So they have the walls where they can't get out, and then the predatory animals who would want to get in and kill them for food couldn't get in, but they had to have a way to get in and out. And so you would have a gatekeeper there to allow the shepherds because you would have multiple flocks, and so each shepherd would come in and get his flock and graze and do what they had to do and then bring them back to the pen. There was a, a common pen, so everybody wouldn't have to have their take the expense of building their own pen. They had this big communal pen. But we're going to get to how because those sheep had been raised hearing that shepherd voice, just like our pet dogs today, when the owner called, he comes. But if someone else calls him, he didn't come because he didn't recognize their voice. He didn't grow up with that stranger calling his name. And same way with sheep. When the shepherd has raised that baby sheep to an adult and hearing that shepherd's voice all his or her life and being fed and hearing that, they recognize that voice. And so when that shepherd comes and he calls them, they come. And so that's what Jesus is using here as an analogy, as a reference to his call, a saint's Christians. We're his sheep. He's our shepherd. And so that's what the point he's ultimately building on and making here. And he also here when he talks about the the robbers and the thief, anyone attempting to get in the pen without using that single door, which the sheep came in and out, was up to no good. Because if you was a shepherd and your flock was in there, you could come and go. But if your sheep went in there, you had no business being in there. So you was doing up to no good. You're trying to steal some sheep. You're coming in, trying to come in when you shouldn't or coming over the wall. So you're a thief or a robber. So in the next verse, Jesus continued to explain that only the legitimate shepherds can come in and out. And only that and only that shepherd is approved by the gatekeeper. This teaching also relies on the unique way sheep naturally learn to respond only to the voice of their shepherd, not others. So Jesus is our shepherd, so we should be learning to respond to his voice. Moving on to verse number two. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the, sh- of the sheep. Jesus alone is our true shepherd. There's no other way. There's no other shepherd. There's no other savior. There's no other God. Verse number three, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out for the sake of continue continuity. We're going to move, move, read verse four as well. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. As I mentioned or earlier, multiple flocks will be kept in a single pen and each person will have their own flock. So I would have a flock. You may have a flock. All of these sheeps are mingled in. But the sheep having been raised and cared for by that single person will respond just to that shepherd. Members of other flocks would not come in response to that voice because that was a stranger to them. They didn't grow up listening to this other shepherd's voice. That other shepherd had not feed them. So when that other shepherd called, if it wasn't his sheep, they ignored him because there was no familiarity between those sheep and that particular shepherd. Jesus is using this analogy in response to the religious leaders of Jerusalem who refused to recognize his miracles and his message. And they're challenging him and he's laying this foundation. No, you can't receive and not, you don't want to receive the truth from me because you're not a part of my flock. You're not listening to my voice because you're not a part of my family. You're not like Abraham who knew me and obeyed me. He, like he told him, as we discussed before, your father, Satan, that's who you're listening to. Because even as we're speaking, your mind, you're plotting to kill me. That's not of me. So, you know, you're not going to hear my voice. But he's laying the foundation that those who belong to me will hear my voice. And we do. We may not get it right all the time, but we hear him. We responded to his call to believe and to 
confess him as Lord and Savior. In plain terms, these men don't listen to Jesus' voice because they're not a part of his flock. As he mentioned to them before, and he's using this analogy to further break that down to them. But as we're going to see, they're they're not going to get it. Because they don't want to get it. Because they're only concerned about themselves and their status and their man-made rules. Moving on to verse number five of John chapter 10. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Those who belong to Jesus recognize his voice and follow him. While recalling from the voices of strangers. When we hear false prophets and false teachings, we are to run from that and follow the true shepherd. In his message, which is found in his word, Jesus. Those who don't listen to Jesus' voice are in plain terms owned by someone else. And Jesus told them who they belong to. Satan. Satan. Moving on to verse number six. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Of course they did. As those not inclined to listen to Jesus in the first place, these men fail to grasp the point he's making because he's talking about them. They don't want to grasp it. The only thing they want him done, the only thing they want to hear is him getting out of town or him dead because he's challenging them. Verse number seven. Therefore, Jesus said again, very Truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. So Jesus said, okay, I'm going to break it down for you. Jesus make the third of seven I am statements found in this book. And as I mentioned in the the other I am statements, Jesus is, is invoking Moses when God told Moses to go to Pharaoh to let his people go and to Tell his people, the Jews and Pharaoh, I mean, Moses asked, well, who should I say sent me? And God told him to tell you, I am sent you because that's who he is. He is. I am the great. I am. And so when Jesus is using these phrase, I am those people, those Jews in that era, in that era during that time, the onlookers who's listening to this conversation, as well as the, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees knew exactly what Jesus was implying, that he is God. Which he is. That's why they wanted to call him. That's why they wanted one the reason why they wanted to, that was another reason why they wanted to kill Jesus, because they thought he was blaspheming. Because they just thought he was a man. And they just, just thought him this was this man who's saying he's God. But he is God. And so when he's using this term, I am, everybody in that crowd is listening is getting what he's saying. They may not necessarily believe it. Some did, some didn't. Most of them didn't. But they knew he was saying, I am God. Here, Jesus in this verse is is saying that he and he alone is the means by which God intended people to come to him for salvation. Because he died for our sin, the perfect sacrifice, never had sinned, couldn't sin, wasn't worthy of. Of the humiliation and the punishment and the death that he went through because he was perfect. We were worthy. I was worthy. You and everybody else was worthy of what he went through. But because in in what he went through, that was a part of God's wrath. That we should have that those that we're all subject to. But the good news If you have accepted Jesus Christ and your Lord and Savior, he's already Jesus took God's wrath on that cross. He took our place. And for those who do not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that he died for their sins, then they will have to take God's wrath on themselves. And that's what we're talking about in the book of Revelation. You don't want that. You don't want that. Think about that. The creator of the universe, everything around you, you and everything in it. Judging you. That's a place you don't want to be and you don't have to be. 
Because Jesus has already taken that judgment and punishment on your behalf. All anything you got to do is accept it. But in this verse, Jesus is telling them he's the only way and he is. Moving on to verse number eight. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. The religious leaders who have controlled Israel to that point are like those trying to sneak into the sheep pen. And calling to sheep that are not theirs, they are spiritually thieves and robbers. And that's what Jesus is telling them. Moving on to verse number nine. I am the gate, Jesus is saying. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Jesus Christ, listen to me now. Jesus Christ is the one and only means by which any person can be eternally saved. There's no other way. There is no other way. You can't save yourself. Buddha can't save you. Muhammad can't save you. No one else but Jesus Christ. He's the only way. And he tells us. There's two. Types of sheep. Sheep. Those are going to be in and those are going to be out. Those are going to be saved and those are going to be unsaved. There will be no in between. There's no third option. Either you have accepted or will accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or you won't. Those are the two categories. There will be mercy and grace and the penalty already paid for those who accept Jesus Christ. And there will be those unsaved who accept the penalty for themselves. And again, that's not a position you want to be in and you don't have to be because the good shepherd has paid the penalty for you. Moving on to verse number 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. In some translation, the King James particularly says and have life more abundantly. The thief here speaks of Satan. In his fellow demons, he comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. That's his mission, and he's on it every day, all day. Jesus seek not to preserve life for the sheep, but to provide it. He provide life to us. Jesus deepens that claim by saying that his purpose is not only to Give us life, but for we can have life more abundantly, more full. And when it says abundant here, a more abundant life is not talking about material wealth and prosperity. Look at Colossians 3, 2 through 3. That abundant life begins with salvation. From an eternity of suffering, the penalty of sin. Because he died for us. And if you accept, believe and confess him, you're going to have eternal life with him. That's abundant life. And a glorified body. So that abundant life start and first and foremost is eternal life. Not more, not more houses and cars. Not to say God won't bless you with those things, but all that stuff is going to pass away. Including this earth and the all is going to be passed away. It's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. That materialistic stuff is going to pass away. But as a born to begin believer. You won't. God word is not going to pass away and believers are not going to pass away. You'll live forever with him. And then finally. Verse number 11. John chapter 10, verse number 11, it says, this is Jesus. Another one of those I am statements. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And he did that. Jesus is the good shepherd. He 
laid down his life for the flock, us. Us, believers. If you believe in confessing, he's already, he's already taken the penalty. He said the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep and he's foreshadowing to the crowd and to the Pharisees that his earthly ministry, his purpose was to come to die on behalf of the sheep, us. That's what he's talking about. And he did that. And we commemorate on this Good Friday that he did that. He took our sins on that cross. God the Father turned his back on him. And he didn't turn his back on him personally, but he, he turned his back on the scene that he represented, that he died for us, our messes, my messes, my sins, yours, everybody's. He did that. Jesus did that. He didn't have to do it, but he did. And we thank him for it. We praise him for it. We acknowledge him. Hallelujah to you. What a wonderful God that we have. What a great shepherd that we have. Thank you for being the great shepherd, Jesus. Thank you. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, I just thank you and I just thank you, Jesus, for this day. I thank you for every day. I thank you for every day. I thank you that we can just celebrate this Good Friday to show the world and commemorate what a great God that we have, that he would sacrifice his life for us. Extending mercy and grace. Love. He did it for us. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that for us. We love you and we appreciate you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. Sending back the Holy Spirit to be our guide, our comfort, our counsel. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In your son's mighty name. Just thank you and we just praise you. And if you're listening to my sound of my voice and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, now is your time. Now is your time. Now is your time. Do not wait. Do not wait. Do not wait. Today is the perfect day to do it, the perfect time to do it. If that's you, if you feel something inside of you saying, I believe what the word of God says about this Jesus saving, dying for my sins and saving for me, saving me, that he was perfect and that he died. If that's you, say this prayer with me, confess it, and join the eternal family of God. Be saved by his wrath, be saved from his wrath. Do it right now. That you do this right now, please. I beg you. You may not get another opportunity. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, I believe and confess that you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus, to die for my sins. I am a sinner and I need him, Jesus, as my savior. Jesus, I confess you as my savior. I confess that you died for, my, for me. I believe and confess that not only did you die, but you rose from death. That Father God raised you from the dead because you were perfect, sinless. I make you my Savior. I ask you for, for forgive my sins. I confess you as Lord and Savior today. In your name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. And if that's you, welcome to the family. 
Welcome to the family. According to God's word, if you call on the name of Jesus, you shall be saved. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he died for your sins. And if you just did that, you should feel joy. Now, it's not about a feeling. Don't get me wrong. A feeling does not save you. The word of God, doing what you just did, saves you. Confessing, believing, and confessing that Jesus Christ died for your sin and he was raised from the dead. That's what saved you. But the joy should come from the fact that your sins are not forgiven. Your mighty God has forgiven your sins and recreated you. Even though you may not feel recreated, you are now recreated and born again in the spirit. The spirit man is now alive and in tune to God. And what you have to do is build on that relationship by studying his word, praying to him. He took your place. And on Sunday, we're going to celebrate Resurrection Sunday that he got out of the grave because the death could not hold him because he was perfect. That is your God. That's your Lord. That's your Savior. We thank you. We thank you, great God. Until the next episode, may God bless you. Amen. We pray that this Bible study has blessed you. If you have a prayer request, you can email it to renewyourmindm at gmail.com or mail it to P.O. Box 721143, Jackson, Mississippi, 39272. Remember, you can hear current and past episodes at any time on our website of RenewYourMindMinistries.org or on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Alexa, Audible, and Google Podcasts. We encourage you to tell others about the program and share our website of RenewYourMindMinistries.org. Jesus says in Mark 16, 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. By telling others about the program, you are doing your part to spread the gospel into all the world about our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Until next time, this has been Renewing Your Mind with the Word of God.